first of all, I just want to say a big... Have I just moved slides already? I have, haven't I? A big thank you for inviting me here. I feel very privileged to be here. It's, I've seen some fantastic, inspiring talks, and I hope in some way I can, I can make you smile today. So I'm basically going to talk about the one project, which is, is a, a project I did for love, I would say, rather than for money. That's the kind of the main thing that differentiates it from my other work. I'm going to give you a very brief background on where I'm from and which is here, um, and what I do roughly, but really I'll be concentrating on, on the one project. So I was born in Scotland near Edinburgh, and I wish this was the view from my house, but it was actually that one. But I, I, I learned how to find, find beauty in this, I'd just like to say. <laughs> so I, I left Scotland quite a long time ago now. I live, lived in London for 25 years, so almost longer than I lived in Scotland. I've sold my tartan, is what people say. And I, I, I came down to study in London and, and actually never left, so I've stayed there ever since. I'm married with two kids, who are my true inspiration. And what do I do? Well, I love telling taxi drivers what I do. Because they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm an illustrator. And it's like, blank. <laughs> or they imagine I'm kind of like a little Beatrix Potter, you know, colouring in. And, and I think that's fair enough. Illustration is a huge industry. And it's very, very diverse. And the best way I can describe what it is, is the word illustrate comes from illuminate, to illuminate something. And it dates right back to illuminated manuscripts. When we embellished the text, or we made the text clearer, we clarified the text, and really the job description hasn't actually changed that much. That mainly what I do when I work professionally, I'm a, I would call myself a commercial artist, and I bring text to life, and that text might be, I work on everything from newspapers to menus, corporate brochures, I mean anything where someone wants a picture to help clarify that text, they bring me in. And there's all different ways of working as illustrators, and I'm just one particular way of working. So essentially what I do is I go to work, I draw, I colour in, and it's a, it's a very nice job. Sometimes I do, a, I do quite a lot of hand lettering as well, and that ends up in lots of different places. This is some stamps I did recently for Royal Mail. So that's a very brief description of roughly what I do. Where I do it, I've... I've the thing about an illustrator is you could work in a little garret, you could work in your bedroom, but I've never worked from home. I've never had that discipline to work from home. I need to get up and get out somewhere every day. And I've always worked in a studio, and I work now in a multidisciplinary studio. There's 24 of us. We're all different creators from architects, designers. And I really like the social aspect of working in a group. We're, we're independent, but we, there's a lot of cross-fertilization. Cross and it never feels like going to work. It feels like it's somewhere where we talked a lot in a lot of the lectures about play. This is where I go to play. Sometimes I play on the floor. And my desk looks, well, my desk did look like that, <laughs> which is covered in paints and pencils and, and lots of stuff. And when I first formed the studio, all of our desks looked like that. That's how we all worked. Mainly, we, mainly most of us were artists. And we, we worked with bits of paper and paint and pencils. And slowly, of course, you know, the computer crept into our lives, and so most desks now look like this. And we've gone from looking like a really cool, hip art school to looking a bit more like an office, which is a bit of a shame. And I still really love this stuff and love working on here, but I actually do work on both computer and my messy desk, I call it, I suppose. But <coughs> I don't actually create anything on the computer. I use it to assemble stuff, and I use it to send stuff, but I don't actually physically create anything on it. And a courier came into, my, into our studio not long ago, and he was waiting to pick up a package from me, and he, I was a bit late. He was waiting, and he was looking at my desk, and he, he, I could see he was really perplexed as to what was going on in this desk. And he said to me, is this, is this, your play, is this a play desk? As if it was like a communal play desk for everyone, for the whole studio. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. Like, forget the tea room, or forget when you're feeling stressed at work. Every workspace, you'd have this play desk where you can go and cut up bits of paper, you can paint, you can draw, you can stick things down. And I think it would be a fantastic thing, because for me, that is a place where I always want to be on this desk more than that desk. This is a desk that makes me super happy. 
which brings me on nicely to what I'm going to talk about, which is my, the project, my love project, the project I did for love. And this is a lovely quote by Picasso called, not called, but <laughs> all children are artists. And I think that's very true, but I think what he, well, the way I interpret this as all children are artists is, is that time when they draw freely, when they draw super freely, when they have no inhibition, and you give them a piece of paper and they'll draw, they'll draw a house as big as a human being. They'll, they'll make the grass blue. You know, they'll draw the inside of something and the outside of something all at the same time. And, and that is an amazingly a wonderful time. And most, most of you here, most children do draw like that. But somewhere along the line, something changes. Around the age of 10, <laughs> children try to attain a kind of realism in their drawing. They try to get some kind of proportion, some kind of scale, some kind of realism. And, and if, they, if they're happy with what they achieve in that realism, if they, if they get some kind of, if they get quite competent at that, they tend to continue drawing. And if they don't, if they don't feel like they've reached that level, they stop. And for, and for many of us, the majority, that stop, that is a, it's a really ultimate stop. It's like it ends. You never pick up the pencil again. I'm rubbish at drawing. I can't draw. Some of you here are thinking, that's me. I can't draw. I've never been able to draw. And you've forgotten about that time before. And you've developed a fear of drawing. And how can something that's so amazing be so scary? I mean, how, does it, how do we develop this fear of drawing? Uh, we, we learn lots of things as kids. We learn how to play music, we sing, we play a sport. And if we don't become geniuses at it, we don't necessarily stop. You know, if you don't become Jimi Hendrix on your guitar, you still might play your guitar throughout the rest of your life. If you play tennis, you, you're not, you're not going to be Nadal, you, you give up. But with drawing, that's it. I'm not good at it, stop. And I think that's a real shame. And this was the, the main motivation behind this project I'm going to talk about which is it culminated in a book project called Let's Make Some Great Art. And this book really was conceived as a way of trying to get back to the... Well, not get back. Children naturally will draw, but I was trying to also reach not just children, but to reach older children and adults. And pretty quickly I learned, as I was trying to come up with ideas for this book, all, all the ideas I came up with I realised were quite ageless. It wasn't like, oh, I'll do this activity for five-year-olds and I'll make this activity for 12-year-olds. A five-year-old would just interpret the idea differently to a 12-year-old or an adult. And so I kind of recognised that it could be a book for anyone from age five to 105. And I tried to put everything I'd learned into this book, everything I'd learned as a kid, because for those of us who don't stop, you learn quite a lot along the way. <laughs> you keep going. And... I learned everything I'd sort of done at art school. I tried to remember back, well, how did I do that? And I tried to put this into the book too. So really, it's like art school in a book. And I thought this, this, will, be, this will be a way you know, to, to remind people how exciting, how exciting drawing is. So the, the book is made up of, it's roughly divided into three sections. The first, number one, is, is art history. And I thought it would be good to have a, art history in there that was accessible. Uh, the second part of the book is art technique, and the third part of the book <coughs> is imagination. So, in in the art history, I, I concentrated on twelve major artists, this, and Jackson Pollock being one of them. And I gave a little bit of biography about each artist, but not too much because I knew kids would switch off if it was too long. And I tried to link one activity to each artist that would have some some kind of you know, relation to the artist. And this activity is a super, super simple kindergarten activity where you get a cardboard box, some tubs of paint, you throw a marble into the colour paint, throw it in the box and roll it around. And you surprisingly get something that looks very much like a Jackson Pollock. <laughs> More than you can believe, actually. And this... You could all do this. This, this, um, this seems like, oh, that's so simple, but actually you... It is very simple, but you're kind of getting into the mindset of what Jack Jackson Pollock was trying to create motion. He was trying to 
talk about an inner self in his work. He was making spontaneous marks. And when you're doing this, it's, much, it's an emotive experience. And you're kind of tuning into the wavelength of Jackson Pollock. So for something that seems like a kindergarten activity, it's actually quite poignant. And I couldn't miss out Leonardo, of course. The exercise here is practice a little bit of your mirror writing, which is always a big hit with the kids, and interpret the Mona Lisa, the most talked about painting in the world. And this has been one of my favorite spreads in the book because of how people have been interpreting it. So I've got hundreds of drawings of the Mona Lisa, uh, interpretations of the Mona Lisa. And, and what's wonderful about that is Depending on the time, you know, if this was 50 years ago, we'd have different interpretations. But what's been great is seeing Lady Gaga as Mona Lisa or Bart Simpson is relevant to the time that, that it's in. And the way people would, would um, interpret her would change in every decade. That's my favourite one, bottom right there. <laughs> so inspired, that one. You know you can do that. You can do that. <laughs> Who remembers blowing ink through a straw? I mean, how, how nice is that? <laughs> Blow ink through a straw. How can I get that into the book? Because I really like... This is kind of... I'd sit at my desk thinking, how can I get that into the book? Ooh, Louise Bourgeois. She likes spiders, spidery things. So I just related the blowing spidery shapes into making some relationship with Louise Bourgeois' scary spiders. And, ki and kids love this little... Just enough information about each artist that... I think Tim was talking about earlier, but how do you get children eating out of your hand? You need blood gore. You need, you know, Van Gogh's ears cut off. That's what you need. You can't have anything too sweet. The, the exercise for Van Gogh was, wasn't about ears or blood, but it was a, a colour exercise. How many, how many yellows can you mix? People are very lazy when they mix colour. People are very lazy, even professional artists. They don't take enough time to mix colour. And this exercise is, you've only got to make... <laughs> lots and lots of different yellows. And it's a really, really rewarding exercise to do when you realize how many you can get. The, the second part of the book, <coughs> or roughly, is art technique. And, and it's best to start, I think, probably maybe the first art technique we, ever, we might have had. And where we, the first time we interpret ourselves as human beings is you blow, 30,000 years ago, we're blowing pigment through our hands or, or, or bones to create an image of ourselves, And you too can do this all across your kitchen wall. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. do, not do, this, do not do this at home. But this was a really, really immediate exercise to show technique and, and a very, very simple stenciling technique that can be used in lots of different ways. And when I was trying to think of these, so many of these techniques I take for granted. I do things all the time. And I really had to really think back carefully. Well. If I want to talk about cross-hatching or hatching, some people might not know what that is. And hatching or cross-hatching derived from engravers when they, to try and get some volume or tone, the best way to do it, because they're scratching into a surface, is to build up a series of lines. And this is a, a wonderful technique and a wonderful thing to learn. And I wanted to put this in the book. <laughs> but funnily enough, I didn't learn this technique from a book. I, I learned this technique by looking, which is, we could argue drawing is all about looking. And in our, in our home, when I was young, we had a floor that was made of parquet flooring, little strips of wood and little patterns. And I was you know, just copying it and learned how to hatch. And subsequently, through experimenting, learned, learned to cross-hatch. So throughout the book as well, I also want to show that you don't have to learn things through books or through this, this is how to do it. You can learn by looking and looking and observing and experimenting. I'm hoping some of you might do this exercise later, which is to get a big blob of gloopy paint. You put it on one side of the paper, you fold it over, and you, you get a kind of Rochard effect. But you also get something that's amazing, which is you get a surprise. And anything you do, the way you get a surprise in art is always a really nice thing. The, the third part of the book is made up of imagination. And for me, this is perhaps the most important part of the book because this is where this is where I try to create exercises that would help overcome that fear of drawing. 
young children don't have this fear. They could uh, they'll take that picture, and before you've even finished the sentence of what you have to do, they're already drawing something amazing. But for older children who use their brains too much, they it's interfering. You know, it's interfering. Like you can't do that. I can't do that. And so I just wanted to give lots of instructions and advice to almost cut out that left side of the brain to to make sure that you just draw freely the way you used to draw as a kid. And I mean, I, I go into that space every single day at work. I go into that place where it's a wonderful space where you lose time. And anyone that makes things with their hands knows what I'm talking about. And it can be gardening, or it can be making knives. But it's, it's a space that's so special. And so special, I never want to take it for granted. And if there's any way I can share that, that feeling, I would be very, very, very pleased if I could do that. The, this spread, um, the plinth spread, has also had as much kind of interesting response as the Mona Lisa. And I love when children say, when they try to think, oh, draw something old, and their interpretation of something old is a grandmother or a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so sin since finishing the book, so it's like all these things you do for love. You don't know where they're going to end up. This is, I do lots of big corporate jobs. This is not a corporate job. This is, you go into publishing, you're not going in into it to make money. But it's, it's just growing this project. And I've been asked to do lots of workshops with kids. And that's really been fantastic because, one, I meet my audience. And it's the first time. It's like, oh, my goodness, check and see if some of these things work. And they're really teaching me quite a lot, too, when I meet them. And I love when people say, what do you need for a workshop? And I say, we need a lot of stuff, and we're going to make a big mess. And I, I know that that's just such a, it's easy to think, oh, that's, that's an easy thing to do. But actually, so many places don't want to make mess. And it's fantastic to have a huge, big space with lots of paint, lots of cut paper, and seeing children just diving in there. I mean, I, I just love this stuff. And um, I wanted this book to be as exciting as some of those screen-based activities. Um, I have two boys, as, as you see, and they, they love being in the computer, and they love drawing. And I thought, how do I make this book as exciting as some of that stuff that really makes them exci excited? And I don't want to get into the debate of which one is better, but I know when my kids spend two hours drawing, it makes me really have a nice feeling in my tummy. <laughs> but if, there, if they were to be spent two hours on the computer doing some game, no matter how good it is, that doesn't leave me quite so comfortable. And I'm, I'm not quite sure why, because they're both learning tools. And I think it's because when a child draws, they're, they're delving into, well, it's a place where they can find themselves, I think. It's their, they find confidence. They find themselves. And it's actually their world. It's, it's their imagination. It's their ideas. It's their, their explorations. And I think that's what makes it very special. And just to prove a point, I made, along with an, an animator called Daniel Britt, we made some films to promote the book, because there's book hardly any bookshops anymore, so you have to find other ways of selling your book. And we made some films, and one of them involves my son and his friend. And this is a one-minute edit of a one-hour drawing episode where they it was an amazing thing to watch, because we set them up with one page from the book and said, do what you like. And they, they drew together like a kind of sparring competition. And they talked about everything, from everything from the black holes to, to life in the universe. It was just so fantastic to observe. And here's a very short edit of it. time ago they used to have a two-headed Tyrannosaurus with an ogre head on its bottom. It eats anything. So that he's a spaceman, it runs up and eats it. This is my NASA spaceman. It would ride around on the rock. It has to be giant and it's probably yeah. 2,000 times bigger than this house. He, he's got machine guns instead of hands to keep them warm. His teeth is pointed at anything in the world. So by nudging someone's finger, He'll cut the whole arm off. Triple time sword. 3,000 times longer than a normal sword. And on the sword, there's a golden crystal you press it with two gold lasers. That would be a really good idea. And the head
that, if that's not proof, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. So just to conclude, um, I like this stuff. And I know you're thinking, why do, why do we need to encourage this? Well, it could go. Don't, don't ever underestimate how, you know, I go into lots of parents' houses and friends' houses, and I don't see lots and lots of art equipment in the corner because it's a bit of a drag to get it all out. It makes a mess. You have to tidy it up. It's much, much easier to get something, a little painting program on, on an iPad. But we make mistakes here. We, we get into a mess here, and, and we all know that mistakes are good. When, when I'm on my computer, I tidy up my mistakes. I can't help it. It's involuntary. I'm always cleaning up. I don't do that here. I have, I have my best ideas here. So I'm, I'm just going to finish by saying I want you to remember <laughs> that time when you were a kid and don't be scared to get your pencils out again because drawing is good for you. That's <laughs> the end.